audition instead of a two. So the one Mueller audition, when the dust settles, ends up being just fine. And in the meantime, we've got all this uh, revenue put in in tax-free savings account that goes out and, and it's lent to people. It fuels investment. It fuels economic growth. People who do build bigger, they pay tax on that. And so we've got extra revenue to help fix the bridges and the, and the roads that uh, are collapsing all around us. It's a, it's a win-win. If you were a smart, rich guy, you would want to move to a state that had a tax plan like that because you'd say to yourself, now I don't have to blow all my hard-earned income on coming-of-age parties for my kids or on big <laughs> mansions. Uh, so so this, isn't, this, this isn't really a controversial proposal. It's, it's rooted in Darwinian logic, the idea that when we all stand, we don't any of us see better than if we'd all remain seated. But... We can we can change those incentives to stand. You know, we can sort of not tell people you can't stand up. Uh, just so, here's here's a little extra payment you have to make if you want to stand up. So and, so uh, so why should a thinking libertarian uh, agree with you? Uh, I can't think of any cogent reason why a libertarian wouldn't want to do that. I mean, some some libertarians aren't thinking about this very clearly. They say all taxation is theft. Well, that's that you can't really take that slogan seriously. It means that there couldn't be a government. You wouldn't have an army. You'd get invaded by some other country that had a government with mandatory ta taxation. And so then you'd pay tax to their government. So so that's not really a, a position anybody would want to defend on reflection. But I think any libertarian who's thought this through would say, yeah, it'd be much better to tax people in that way. In fact, when I first published an article about this back in the, the late 90s, I got a nice letter from Milton Friedman. The, the patron saint, oh, yes. Yes. the late Milton Friedman, the patron saint of small government conservatism. He said he didn't agree that the government should be raising more money. Uh, this was a, at a time, recall, when budgets were going to surplus. Uh, we do need more money now. But he said that if we did need more money, the best way to raise more money would be with exactly the tax I'd proposed. And he sent me a reprint of his own paper published in the 1943 volume of the American Economic Review in which he had advocated a progressive consumption tax as the best way to pay for the World War II effort. So, so here's, a, here's a, a, some ground where I think left and right could coalesce and, and adopt a change that would make everybody better off. Uh, we could raise lots of money from a tax like this. We could do lots of things that need to be done for the common good, and nobody would have to make any painful sacrifices at all. So uh, is this being taken seriously? Is this on the radar screen? <laughs> uh, I've been writing about this for, for 30 years. Uh, when, when I first published a book advocating this, what was it? It was 1985, so not quite 30 years. I thought to myself, the book's coming out in January. Uh, by the fall term in Congress, we'll, we'll see bills wending their way through the House and Senate to do this. Uh, there was actually a bill in the Senate in 1995 to adopt a progressive consumption tax. It never got voted on. There were budget battles that took things in a different direction. But this is doable. Uh, I, I was on an NPR show last uh, two summers ago, and I was about to propose my tax idea when an economist from the conservative think tank, the American Enterprise Institute, beat me to the punch. He proposed it. So uh, <laughs> I, I think we could do this. So yeah. what, the, why, does, why is uh, uh, common sense not prevailing? Or could it prevail? I mean, you, maybe we can be, you know, can we be optimistic about this. You know, the moment anybody says we should tax something, uh, if it's, if it's a, a senator or congressman, he's immediately buried under an avalanche of a tax ad saying, Smith thinks the bureaucrats in Washington know how to spend your money more wisely than you do. Uh, talking about taxes is very hard in this climate. Uh, people have a very strong knee-jerk reaction uh, against any form of tax. And so what that reaction overlooks is that we have to tax something. And if you don't think clearly about what to tax, you're going to end up taxing the wrong things, which is what we're, we're currently doing. So what, so spend a little bit more time on why the level of discourse is so low on, uh, on this. I mean, I think that itself is an interesting question to approach it, from it, an evolutionary perspective. It, it's an interesting question, and especially since the, the position advocated by wealthy interests on the right, if you would look at the evidence, uh, they're advocating for policies that are contrary to their own narrow individual interests. So if you think about it, uh, 
the, the government is strapped for cash. You, you drive on any roads uh, around Binghamton, you'll, you'll have the fillings jarred from your teeth. There are potholes everywhere. Uh, bridges are collapsing. Rich people fall into the river and drown when a bridge collapses, the same as poor people. The, the Bush administration, to, to pay for the tax cuts that his, his base was, was able to, to wring from uh, the legislature, the, the, the tax cuts for the wealthy that were enacted in 2001 and three. They've cut back where they could, and one of the programs they cut back was the Energy Department's program to round up loose nuclear materials in the former Soviet Union. What a strange thing to cut back on. You know, that if, you, if you live in the U.S., sooner or later there's going to be some terrorist who, who gets hot nuclear materials from one of these facilities in the former uh, Soviet Union. They're not carefully guarded. The, the soldiers who are charged with guarding drink too much. They don't get paid regularly. The fences aren't very high. We <laughs> should be locking these things down. It's going to be your kids that get killed in the dirty bomb that, that gets produced from from those materials. Why should we be cutting that? Just build a smaller mansion and there'll be money to pay for that. <laughs> and, if, and if everybody does that, you won't, you won't, you'll not only not be less happy than before, you'll be happier than before. You won't have so many staff to have so under your, I mean, uh, I love talking about this and, and uh, one reason I love talking to you is that you're an uh, insider in, in, in the field of economics. I'm an outsider. Uh, we agree on most about everything, but what prevents a person such as yourself from having a stronger voice in, in this? Or maybe you do, but uh, um, uh, just uh, t t tell me a little bit about that. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a great question. Uh, I think economists through history, starting with Adam Smith, but also many others since him, uh, James Duesenberry, Torsten Veblen in the late 19th century, have made the point that relative payoffs matter enormously to people and that you get distortions because of that. Uh, and this point gets some attention from time to time and then it always recedes from view. I think people, uh, somehow they think if you take this seriously, you're endorsing negative emotions like envy and, and jealousy. Uh, nothing of the sort. Look, if, if you want to send your kid to a, a decent school, the the thing you have to do is outbid other parents for a house in a good school district. The good schools are in the more expensive neighborhoods and we'll move heaven and earth in order to bid as much as we can for access to the best schools we can as, as parents. And if the banks let us borrow more, we're going to we're going to borrow more. Uh, and we saw the housing bubble when the banks did let us borrow more. The alternative is to sit back and watch others get the house in the good school district. That means your kids go to the schools where the other kids score in the 20th percentile of reading and math or their metal detectors at the front gates of the schools. You're not going to sit still for that. You're going to bid for a, a, a more expensive house if you possibly can. And what that means is that people end up with no retirement savings. They, they end up deep in debt and so on. And when the dust settles, all they succeed in doing is bidding up the prices of the houses in the better school districts. Still, half the kids have to go to bottom half schools. That's the law of musical chairs. And so I think it's, it's just a failure to, to conceive of what your interests are clearly that's, that sort of stood in the way. Well, there's a, there's a hidden culprit which I've discovered, and I'd like to get your opinion on it, which is um, that these common sense ideas are hard to incorporate into the mathematical edifice of neoclassical economics. And uh, since you're an expert in that too, is that, is that not the case? Is that this whole kind of glamour of having a a mathematical edifice uh, founded on the ideal of Newtonian physics is kind of getting in the way of incorporating some of these common sense assumptions into economic theory. Yeah, I considered that explanation and I, and I don't think in the end I would put much weight on it uh, just because it's quite possible to incorporate concerns about rank and position into formal models of behavior. I published a paper in the American Economic Review in 1985 with a, a very simple formal model of how those, those sorts of concerns would tilt consumption towards some kinds of goods and away from others in a, in a, a pattern that would make everybody worse off than if, if, if they acted collectively in deciding on on how to spend that same money. So it's not that we can't formalize this, we can. I think uh, 
a, a bigger concern is that once you admit that rank matters, then all bets regarding the invisible hand are off. And so I think a lot of economists, especially free market oriented economists, are, are just fearful that if you admit this into the conversation, it's going to trigger an avalanche of intrusive government regulation that, that nobody's going to like. And, and that's a fear. That's, that's a, you, you don't want mindless bureaucrats making decisions to micromanage every aspect of, of your lives, obviously. What I think, though, is that we can we can deal with a lot of these incentive problems with very unintrusive manipulations of the tax system, with things that change your incentives, but that you don't feel uh, as intrusive at all. And I think the the guiding model is the the effluent permit system that we adopted for sulfur dioxide emissions. You, you know, when you and I first got to upstate New York, we would read articles every day in the newspapers about acid rain. It was befouling the lakes and forests around the Adirondacks. We needed to do something. You don't read those articles anymore. And the reason is that now you have to pay if you want to discharge SO2. The reason firms were discharging SO2 in excess was that it was free to dump it into the air. Once you have to pay, then you look for ways to filter it out. And the, the people who are good at filter, filtering it out do the, the most uh, of the cleanup effort. And others, if they, if they have no alternative but to dump some, then we get a little. In that, but we're willing to tolerate a little when it's costly to filter it out. So we can, we can intervene in those ways. Uh, it's not a nightmare for libertarians to unleash this kind of uh, an intervention system. It's really, you got to tax something. Unless you want to be invaded by another country, you got to tax something. So why not tax things that cause harm to others? That's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's I the think, bottom line. Yeah, and I think in general, one of the things that I emphasize is that is that uh, this very common sense view, which uh, which emerges from uh, um, uh, evolutionary thinking, but is also just plain commonsensical in retrospect, does not fall into any existing political camp. And so right. there is a kind of a middle way. That might appeal to people on all sides, and uh, and 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 wouldn't that be great if we could uh, if we could get that word out? I'll say, yeah. It it look. It, it seems like if people understood the argument, you wouldn't need to be a brilliant politician to sell it. Uh, the argument's one that promises money for nothing. You can make uh, gold out of lead here. We can <laughs> actually increase the size of the economic pie, and as I emphasize to my students, ad nauseum. Whenever you can make the economic pie bigger, it's always possible that everyone can get a bigger slice than before. And if if you can do that, who's who's in the wings to object? I mean, this is this is win 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 if you do it. Yeah. So I think it, it's just really a matter of getting it into the conversation and having people understand the argument. Then I think there wouldn't be any substantive reason to, for anyone to resist these proposals. Well, I'm very pleased to be able to put all of this on uh, on video. It'll be a YouTube in moments. And uh, and uh, so um, uh, for the moment, uh, let's sign off. So thank you very much, Bob. Thanks for taking time to, t to talk about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted so, to get uh, a chance actually, to Actually, hold up, hold up your book one more time. We're going to sell some copies right. here. All right, here you go. It's the Darwin Economy. Princeton University Press. It's, it's from Princeton University Press. It's been on Amazon for a few days now. And my publisher tells me that uh, books like this, serious books like this, if they find an audience at all, which often they don't, uh, find it more through social media, people telling their friends about it, than through conventional channels, which aren't very powerful anymore anyway. And so if, if people read the book and think the arguments are important, uh, he, he says for me to tell them to go on the Facebook page of the book, they've built a nice one. Uh, the Darwin Economy's Facebook page uh, at Princeton is is a, a nice compendium of things about the book. Uh, I'm guessing there'll be a link to this clip on there shortly, so uh, people can go there and then tell, click on the like button. That helps, and uh, tell your friends. Send it to your Facebook friends. Tell them to go check it out. That's that's the message. And let's hope that this goes viral and that is yeah, the exactly. uh, voting public who uh, who tells the politicians what to do. Okay, this is David Sloan Wilson signing off for Evolution, This View of Life. Thanks a lot.